Okay, welcome to the Remote Me project. This is a um, sub-project within Brenner. Brenner is a much larger project. The output of Remote Me is required for Brenner, so Remote Me is on the critical path of Brenner development. But the Remote Me project itself is a standalone um, module which we can consider separate for the purposes of funding, initially funding required for um, Brenner as well as Remote Me. The history of uh, the Remote Me project is it's been around since 2014 when um, uh, I would say the formal start of it was um, registration of a company called Remy Limited, which is an abbreviation of Remote Me, Remy, multilingual. Um, and that company has existed in the background since 2014. And the purpose of that company was to uh, carry out this industrial project um, in the form of um, a vehicle which uh, could supply funding to the project and which uh, supplied services in the form of my own engineering um, services to industrial companies uh, around the UK uh, and usually in defence industry but often in um, uh, air, air traffic management and civilian uh, air traffic control projects. So um, since early 2017 it's also been a PhD research project because we came up against a problem which was the rate of data through the internet. It's the lag, the time it takes for data to, trans, uh, you know, to transmit through the internet. Um, you have at least 100 milliseconds of delay and that is too big to be um, inside your feedback loop if you're trying to use a VR headset or, or first person view goggles to control a machine which is flying at several meters per second. Uh, just not possible with uh, any more than a few, a few milliseconds of delay really. Um, so um, PhD research project uh, has been formally underway since 2017. Uh, the industrial project goal is to make it possible to fly a remote UAV in real time in first person view using VR equipment via the internet. Um, <clears throat> the, PA, the PhD project goal is to test the hypothesis that the above can be achieved using a virtual world as an intermediary. Um, in other words, the industrial project goal um, to fly the remote UAV in real time in first person view, uh, it was impossible doing direct via the internet, uh, direct to the UAV. So um, a hypothesis was put together where, where we use a virtual world in the middle to actually achieve the, uh, the same effect. It's, uh, it's achieved by a specially designed UAV, uh, which enables all of those things. Um, in other words, we're, it's a UAV with some special functionality um, that enables this to happen. It's also a world's, a world's first. It's never been done before. Uh, this, uh, the reason it's an academic PhD project is because we're breaking uh, new technology, really. It's a new, a new um, setup. It's never been done. Uh, to give an idea of the applicability of uh, the Remote Me, um, we can have a quick look at some of these use cases. Um, it's, I've listed only a few here. Um, but this covers um, a very large um, market in effect. As, uh, the blue uh, circles here are the use cases and the stick um, men are the um, actors and industries. Uh, so all of these use cases can be used by any of these industries really. Um, so it's a very large, a very large market. Okay, so moving on to the um, concept of operation. Um, in a normal scenario, we have uh, the operator who interacts directly with uh, a UAV that he has uh, either in line of sight or he's got FPV goggles on. And in UK law, that, require, that requires uh, a second person to be standing with him watching that UAV in line of sight um, because the law says you can't fly a UAV um, without line of sight contact at the moment in the UK. I think in the USA they've just changed that, so maybe we'll follow. Who knows? Still, not, um, it's, it's, it's not an easy scenario to fly a UAV <coughs> in any case. 
um, because even in a link this length, even a direct radio link there via Wi-Fi or something like that, you've still got quite a big, uh, you know, a noticeable uh, delay in the time it takes for the UAV to respond to your head movements or um, whatever you're doing to control it. Uh, there is a noticeable lag through that length of, uh, um, through that type of com uh, radio communications control link. <coughs> So the remote base scenario, how does it get around that? <clears throat> um, we have um, on the right a virtual world scenario and on the left the real world. Um, the real UAV we can see pictured on the left is actually controlled by the UAV position in the virtual world. And the UAV position in the virtual world is set by the controller, the operator. So the operator, when they're moving around in the virtual world, in the form of a UAV avatar, then the movement of that avatar in the virtual world is tracked out to the movement on the real UAV. So if you move within a foot of that um, wall there, then the real UAV will move a, a, a foot within the wall. So, um, and at the same time, uh, the real UAV um, has uh, data scanning hardware on there, which reflects a virtual equivalent of its real environment back into the virtual environment. So as the UAV, the real UAV is moving around, it's constantly scanning its um, virtual scenery and sending that back into the virtual world. And so in the virtual world, we'd see that building up gradually as the real UAV is moving around. And if you had an area of the real virtual architect, uh, virtual scenery there, which um, was not complete or had holes in it or was done in error in some way, then you can go back around with the real UAV. You just move your UAV avatar to, over to that area where you think there's a problem. And the real UAV will move to the real scenery there and scan it again. And any errors or uh, missing um, data will be filled in and corrected. So um, I think that gives you the scenario in the remote me UAV concept of operation. Um, what is the key enabling technology? Why hasn't this been done before? It is this thing called structure from motion. Um, it's only just been uh, demonstrated in the last year uh, on a, a lab laboratory system uh, to be something that can be practically used with um, portable equipment. And the actual demo that I've seen is uh, on an iPad. Um, it's been the subject of intense academic research up until then and probably still now. And it's, uh, that was the first practical demonstration of port portable equipment in 2017. And the code is open sourced and it's in a registry, a GitHub repository uh, named Bundle Fusion. So that was that's the intended um, implementation for the remote me is to take that code and adapt it. Uh, remote me versus conventional survey time. This gives you an idea of how much of an improvement in um, efficiency you've got in carrying out a remote survey using the remote me scenario as opposed to a conventional survey. Um, use it interacting directly with the UAV on the site. Um, here you can see um, on a good day you might get a survey done in the morning. So that's half a day. Um, I don't think that would be unreasonable. If you, uh, to only take a few hours to fly around the building uh, scanning it in detail and visually inspecting the um, scenery as you construct it and uh, to get around that. Unless it's a huge building or maybe a, a number of buildings but you know, one sort of uh, you know moderate-sized building uh, shouldn't take more than a few hours to scan. Uh, on a conventional site survey, uh, they would they would fly exhaustively for a whole day because they take the the, the the trouble to get there with their equipment, and they then have to gather a series of uh, photographs. Uh, from which they know that they will carry a photogrammatic, uh, photogrammetric, photogrammetric, 
photogrammetric processing um, phase, which um, will convert their series of photographs into a 3D model. Um, now, the thing is, they don't know how much data and how, what quality of uh, photographs they've really got until they start that photogrammetic uh, processing. Um, so it's not until after they've carried out the survey and gone home with the UAV, then they find out the quality of their data. So they will spend uh, as much time as possible gathering as many photographs as possible uh, on the site before they actually go back to do the photogrammetric processing. So in a minimum, it would be a day for the survey and then a day for the processing. So two days minimum. That's, that's four times as long as the UAV, the remote V scenario already. Now, if they find that in the, the um, data that they've got, there are some holes or there's some errors or something missing, then they have to go back to that site and repeat those two days again. So in that case, they lose, uh, they've actually eight times as long as four days compared with half a day for the uh, remote me scenario. And the way that remote me works is you, um, you have this instant checking capability. Your model is appearing as you're gathering your data. So it's all happening at the same time. And you can immediately see if the model's got problems, you need to go back and revisit that. So all you do is fly back over that, lift, that, that spot just to uh, watch it reforming and, and repairing. Uh, whereas in this case, you, you've got a whole you know, revisit to your site and a, a whole new survey to do again. So remote me advantages, uh, real time anywhere, accurate first person view, remote control, a world's first. As we've said, it's the first time ever. Uh, we've also got this capability of flying third person POV. Uh, to explain what we mean there, I'll go back to I well, can't go back to the other slide. Um, third person per point of view, what it means really is when you're interacting as the avatar in the virtual world, you can remove your camera point of view because it's a virtual world. You can easily look from any point of view in the virtual world so that you can see your uh, UAV avatar and the building at the same time. Now, if that's a, in a remote uh, now, as you know, it's, it's in a remote place, so effectively that is like having a second UAV with a camera point of view watching the first UAV. That's pretty much impossible in real life, um, but it, this is a scenario you've got with the um, remote view. You've also got real-time automatic construction 3D model, as we said. It's lower cost than LiDAR solutions. Uh, LiDAR equipment is very expensive and uh, I tend to, it's, it's quite, it's quite, um, it has high calibration requirements uh, where uh, you drop that equipment or um, dent it in any way, it's, it's, it needs to be recalibrated if not completely trashed. Um, so it's expensive, delicate equipment. Um, and the remote me advantage, another remote me advantage is it's simplified piloting. So piloting is much easier not needed, uh, you don't really need specialist training uh, to fly uh, the UAV in this scenario because you're constrained by what you can do in the virtual world. So it, whatever you can do with an avatar, uh, move it back with your forward and back arrow keys, maybe press an up to fly, down to, to land, um, is how, how it flies. And the UAV has a lot of intelligence on it and uh, obstacle avoidance, um, which will uh, take over in the case that you do something that is, uh, is going to cause it to crash. So um, it's also, we have, also have the immediate inspection refinement capability of the 3D model, as we said. Uh, minimizes are required in air time. So you can be up and back down again in a few hours uh, once you're happy with the 3D model. Whereas in the manual photogrammetry uh, scenario, then you could be there the whole day, maybe even a couple of days. Eliminates the possibility of site revisits, as we said, and it's applicable to any remote monitoring surveying application. Um, we've got the device charging model. Um, this is where we are building in a capability to charge for the data that comes from the UAV back to the virtual world. So. Although we can set it up so that there is no charge, we can also set it up so that there will be a charge per data. And that definition of that system is still in development. 
It's uh, within the device. It's uh, the I IOTA API um, and Data Marketplace integration. And that also integrates with the device owner wallet. And the IOTA Data Marketplace would be interfaced with the customer's data wallet. So you actually um, have a transfer of funds which takes place in response to a transfer of data. The data goes from the device owner, from the device, back to um, the data customer, and the funds go from the data customer to the device owner. And that's uh, the IOTA integration part. The Remote Me prototype current status is, as we can see in the bullets here, uh, mechanical design 80% complete. Um, the only things left there are um, some the uh, third bullet point, all mechanical uh, electrical components designed, purchased, except for gimbal and battery enclosure. So um, the uh, mechanical design needs to accommodate the battery, the gimbal, and the um, what I also know is there's some details that might need to be adjusted for the, uh, um, there's a system called guidance. Uh, supplied by DJI and those components sit around the edge of the, the uh, chassis and they scan the environment for the um, collision avoidance. So <clears throat> those, there's four sensors pointing around uh, uh, horizontally and another a fifth one pointing vertically down the way. Uh, all of those components need to be um, just checked that we've got that, that, that they, they can you know they are accommodated on the chassis. Um, MATLAB Simulink model is in process. Uh, the code will be generated directly from MATLAB Simulink for the Raspberry Pi. Uh, the structure from Motion Pipeline is to be converted from OSX to MATLAB uh, because the form, the equipment that was used on the original project is an iPad. So, and we need it to run on the Raspberry Pi, so that needs to be converted. Uh, Raspberry Pi driver also needs to be developed for the structure sensor, which is all part of the same system really. The structure sensor is a special camera sensor device similar to um, Microsoft Connect, uh, which goes to the on the gimbal, and that's a data collector for the uh, the structure from motion pipeline. The control interfacing from the virtual world to the UAV needs to be defined, um, and the data interfacing from the IOTA data marketplace to the virtual world needs to be defined. Uh, the IOTA charge for data API needs to be developed. So. The two biggest lumps of work here are the last one, IOTA Charge for Data API to be developed. That needs to be probably built from scratch, but there's, there's a comprehensive data uh, on that, on how to do that in IOTA. So not a lot of technical risk, just uh, a fair bit of uh, learning, a steep learning curve to, to do that. Um, the structure from motion pipeline, conversion from OSX to MATLAB, that is a fair uh, that is another large, you know, substantial piece of work. Um, again, probably a few months for that. So I've, I've got some, um, we'll see next, some time estimates, but this is a current status. Um, estimated development times and outlay. Kickoff on funding. Uh, that means everything here is subject to uh, getting funding and the kickoff would be uh, starting from that point. So IOTA, API, three months. I would say three months of work uh, in that API. Not sure, uh, so that there's, um, it's an unknown, um, but all the data is available. Uh, it just takes a while to get through it and define the actual, what needs to be done. Um, the initial prototype demo, six to nine months. The uh, reason I've put that flexibility on there is because this component of the API, the IOTA API, is, is an unknown quantity up to three months. Uh, it could be a lot less, in which case initial prototype demo will be uh, you know, somewhere between six and nine months. Uh, deliverable fully operational units, 12 months. So that's the time taken to refine um, the, you know, a, a deliverable unit pre-production uh, from an initial demo. Uh, minimum funding required 80k euro to an initial prototype um, and that would be to cover this 69 months.
Uh, there's a certain amount of material and software outlays in amongst that, but um, that's basically for one person, myself, to carry out that work. Uh, further, 80k euro needed from initial prototype to fully operational deliverables. And that 80k euro would need to have that that has um, components in it for um, buying materials um, to manufacture the pre-production deliverables. Uh, expected deliverable product, expected deliverable product price 3k euros. Um, that might change. Um, uh, I, you know, I know the price of uh, commercial drones, and it's not unusual to pay up to 10k for a, a commercial drone. Um, and this is aimed primarily at the uh, professional market uh, for the moment. Uh, long term, it would be um, consumer, but at the moment, uh, for this uh, product release and concept release, uh, it's most appropriate to professionals rather than um, rather than uh, enthusiasts. Uh, the time scales could be reduced with further funding to expand the development team. So uh, with each team member added we'd be more cost but we would get there quicker. And finally links. Um, Drone Zone uh, is a good place to go and have a look. That particular link takes you to LiDAR and photogrammetry and how it works in current sort of industry practice. Uh, HTTPS SPA3D is uh, another uh, LiDAR um, link. It's a link which takes you to uh, low-cost LiDAR. Uh, so you can compare that with uh, what we've got in the, in the remote me system. Again, LiDAR won't give you uh, remote piloting capability. Only the remote me will be able to do that. Uh, and our code repository on github.com Remy Research. So you can go there, have a look, and see what code is there that has actually been used and worked on. And, and that's it. Thanks for your time. Um, have a good day.